is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think we need to rethink and re-criminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. What's up, Russ? How you doing? Soak it in. Soak it in. Good, good, good to be here. The yeah, the crowd's not as wild for me, but that's okay. I don't know. Racism. Uh, they're, they're still a little hungover from the Ivory Island hour last night. I'd imagine <laughs> it's all good. Well, today, let's see. We're going to be uh, tracking a bill uh, in Arizona it has advanced. I'm going to tell you all about that. We're going to go to the East Coast where a dispensary's just opened up. Going to cover that. Also, Russ, you'll love it. I have a sports story where I get to say the words Boise State. So I'm going to do that. Oh. And plus a fascinating case out of uh, Virginia. One of these sort of like tabloid uh, death cases, you know, that people watch. Marijuana was introduced into that case this week. Interesting. I'm going to tell you all about that as well. And now you can all hear me because my mic is on. I so was rolling that's in the background. <laughs> that's good news. <laughs> yeah, when I record the stuff offline, when when the show's not on, I have to turn that feed part off, and I uh, forgot we to were, put that we button back on. We were talking to each other. Earlier. Yeah, but there we go. At least uh, you got the introductions for everybody else. Welcome back to the show for everybody. Also on today's show, uh, we got, uh, in, in, in addition to the news that Carrie's got, I've got news of another innocent victim of a drug war raid and uh, news about the Discovery Channel Weed War show. Joining us uh, at uh, 20 After, of course, Ganja John is here for the uh, Groovin' Thursday music. What do we got for uh, music today? Pep Love. Pep I'm Love. One of the Pep Boys, right? Yes. There's Pep Love, Pep Hate, and Pep Indifference. Oh, I see. Well, that makes no, perfect No, not sense. one of the Pep Boys. <laughs> not one of the Pep Boys. One of the hieroglyphics. We're, gonna, we're going to... Uh, play some new music that we just got permission to play and we're really really excited about it so stay All tuned right cool stuff also uh, terry joyce joins us for the southern california scene patrick duff is back to tell about how he fought the law and he won and then at the end of the show time for a radical rant i'm going to tell you about the true threat of impaired drivers out there on the road and it ain't us that's smoking weed all that and more coming up here on normal show live you're listening to normal show live the voice of the marijuana nation weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. 
WeedMaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. WeedMaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit WeedMaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection with activated carbon fiber. Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or a flashy design. Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from Stealth-Products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Elliot Beats. Stealth-Products.com. Stealth-Products.com. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. We wanted to update you about the movement of a bill we've been tracking here. In the beginning of February, we told you the Arizona House of Representatives passed a bill to ban medical marijuana on college and university campuses, as well as child care facilities. The 2010 voter-approved medical marijuana law in Arizona had already banned the use of medical marijuana in public areas and public schools, but that left the door open for the campuses of colleges where often students reside. The sponsors of the bill said the law was necessary to protect the federal grants and student aid loans that colleges depend on. House Bill 2349 passed the House in February with a 52-2 to vote over the objections of one Democrat, Representative Ed Ablazer, who said that the lawmakers didn't have the right to alter laws the voters approved. The Arizona Medical Marijuana Association agrees and has called the law illegal. Lawmakers can alter voter-approved initiatives in the cases where it furthers the purpose of the measure. The AMMA says banning students and, cam- uh, students and campus visitors from possessing or using their medical marijuana does nothing to further the intent of the initiative. The law also needed three-fourths of vote from both houses since it was altering a voter-approved law. Well, we can report to you that that bill has now met that threshold in both the houses of the Arizona legislature. The Senate passed that bill 28 to 2 yesterday to prohibit the use or possession of medical marijuana at public universities, community colleges, or child care facilities. They read a long list of the bill's supporters before the vote, many of them university officials from ASU and other universities, state prosecutors, and teacher association officials, because they said the bill clarified and made absolutely sure that medical marijuana would not be used in schools K through 12, even though that's already in the law. Now, there were only two names listed in opposition to the bill, the American Civil Liberties Union and a private citizen. The bill will now go to Governor Jan Brewer for her signature before it becomes a law. The governor is expected to sign that measure. Joe Uhas, a spokesman for the Arizona Medical Marijuana Association, says that the law will most likely be challenged on grounds it violates a constitutional protection for voter approved laws. Yeah, I would think that it doesn't uh, further the purpose of the initiative, which was to protect people who use marijuana for medical purposes from arrest. It didn't say protect people who are not going to college from arrest for medical marijuana. I mean, college students can have the same list of conditions that qualify for medical marijuana as anyone else does. Now, what this law comes down to, what this bill comes down to, is yet another example of discrimination against cannabis and its users because of the stereotyping and and the, the constant demonization of marijuana and its users. They're not talking about banning any other sort of medication that college students might be using, and for that matter, abusing on college campuses at 
Adderall, I'm looking your way. Ritalin, I'm looking your way. And I'm sure that the boys at Alpha Tappa Keg won't be stopped from uh, throwing the next big alcohol binge drinking party. But marijuana, somebody using it for medical purposes, someone who's jumped through all the hoops they've got to jump through to be able to use cannabis medically, you're going to stop them from being able to bring that on the campus or be able to live on campus with their medicine. Shame on you, Arizona. Shame on you. We are celebrating this week the opening of the first medical marijuana dispensary in Portland, Maine. Maine passed a medical marijuana law in 2009, and that law allowed for eight medical marijuana dispensaries to be established across the state. The Wellness Connection in Maine also has permits to open dispensaries in Hallowell, Thawmaster, and Brewer, towns of about 2,500 people, 3,800 people, and 9,500 people, uh, respectively. The dispensary in the small town of Hollowell has already opened their doors to patients. Now, Maine is the largest city in the state. Uh, it shares a metropolitan population of around half a million residents, almost a third of the population in the entire state. But that dispensary had a soft opening in the Portland facility. The executive director of the Wellness Connection of Maine said that they are not planning a grand opening and they are planning an open house for community leaders sometimes later this year. The Portland location had received some pressure from the medical marijuana program manager John Thiel late last year because the facility planned to have a vapor lounge. They described in their paperwork a vapor lounge as quote a place where patients could sit and breathe in marijuana based medicinal compounds while avoiding the respiratory and carcinogenic risks associated with smoking. Thiel had expressed some concerns that the lounge would become a hangout, so the organization dropped their plans for the Vapor Lounge in response. They will have rooms for acupuncture, counseling, and a community room where they will hold educational events. The group has spent more than $150,000 on renovations to the 6,500 square foot space on Congress Street, and they say they will serve more than about 100 patients in the first few months of operation. So far, the dispensary is only taking patients by appointment, but they are hoping to open up Uh, Mondays for drop-ins when they catch up on the first round of patients that are already signing up and are on a waiting list to come in and see the new facility. Well, well, uh, you know, this is uh, this is good news to hear Portland, Maine, finally getting some dispensaries uh, put together according to their uh, law. Um, I'm always bugged when they talk about, you know, having a a lounge or a medicating area and and now they want to reject that. You know, oh, we don't want it to be a hangout. We don't want that to be a hangout. God forbid that sick people hang out with each other. Oh, that would be terrible. You know, they don't understand that when you're a medical marijuana patient, you don't get a lot of the freedoms that a lot of other people get that use other medicines. I mean, if you're using any other medicine for pain management and you want to go to a ball game or a concert or, you know, a movie, you can take your Oxycontin with you. You can take the pill bottle into the theater and you can pop those pills if you need to while you're watching the concert, the play, the the, the movie, whatever it might be. Medical marijuana patients don't get that. So they need to have places where they can hang out, where they can uh, be social with one another. One of the worst things about being sick is the isolation that's part of it. And so giving these people a social outlet is a good thing. And I knew when the story came up, when you said there's a dispensary in Portland, I, I kind of got my hopes up. But then I remembered that uh, nobody in Portland sells weed for money in the medical marijuana sense. So that couldn't be it. <laughs> that's what I thought, too. A story that mentions Boise State. Here you go, Russ. Bakari Rambo, the defensive back for Georgia, has failed a drug test and tested positive for marijuana. Now, Rambo was suspended for last year's opener against Boise State for another violation. So this one would cause him to have an automatic four-game suspension for 2012, what could be a career ender for the senior with bigger aspirations. According to his friends, it was a marijuana brownie that he consumed during spring break while with a large group of friends that may end his football dreams. Some friends who were staying with him had brought the brownies. They said that he agonized for hours over it after eating the brownies, saying that if he turned himself in, he knew he would get the automatic four-game suspension. Rambo says that he will appeal the suspension and try to enter the NFL's supplemental draft if possible. This year he had 55 tackles, eight interceptions, and is one of Four starters that will miss the first few games of the season due to suspensions. One other person on that list, defensive uh, back Brandon Smith, will also miss a few games after being arrested for marijuana possession earlier this year. (laughs) Well, suspending SEC players for marijuana, gosh, that would seem to be one of the lowest things on the list you could suspend SEC players for. But anyway, uh, this is a shame, you know, that this this guy's NFL career might be potentially impacted for, you know, just eating a pot brownie. And I've said it before, when we're talking about these athletes that are in their prime of their lives, in the the top 
peak condition in order to compete at that high a level. We're really worried about whether or not they're smoking pot or eating pot brownies. Seems a little ridiculous. And an interesting introduction of marijuana into a well-followed trial in Virginia this week. Sandy Clower was scheduled to be sentenced yesterday after a long 13 months of tangled litigation for her role in the alcohol poisoning death of a 17-year-old girl. Her boyfriend and her son were also implicated in the death of Brianne Shiner. Yesterday's sentencing was attended by media and family members alike, but the judge in the case sent her to jail to wait for sentencing because the 48-year-old woman had traces of marijuana in her body. Taswell County Circuit Judge Scott Shore determined that he could not impose a sentence when the legal issue of her, quote, ability to proceed was in question. Clower tested positive for marijuana two weeks ago in a pre-sentencing procedure by the county probation department before her scheduling sentence then. But she never made it in front of a judge two weeks ago because the prosecutor was out of court that day due to an illness. So yesterday, Judge Shore had a brief whisper discussion with Clower, and she admitted to the judge that she would probably test positive again if they tested her yesterday, but said she would like to proceed with the sentencing. But Shore replied, quote, in the interest of justice, he mm. couldn't comply. The judge revoked her bond, and she is ordered now to wait in a jail cell until her next scheduled sentencing, which is on April 13th, if she tests clean from drugs. The charge that she was actually found guilty of in the months-long trial was uh, a violation of the State Liquor Control Act. The judge says that he will credit her with time served while they are waiting for her to test clean, as it is known that marijuana metabolites can stay in your system for months, depending on the amount consumed. Sandy and her son Paul were arrested last February uh, when 17-year-old Brianne chugged a large amount of vodka straight from a vodka bottle that was purchased by her 51-year-old boyfriend, Robert Tomlinson, now who was also charged. She passed out that night and died in her sleep. Her 20-year-old son, Paul Clower, had requested uh, the boyfriend to buy the vodka for his party. Her son, who had a lengthy criminal record, and Robert Thomason, who bought that vodka, received six months uh, for their role in the crime, along with some probation time. Oh, what a shame in that cry, in that uh, story there. Um, and uh, gosh, I don't, I don't even know what to say about it. So I'm just going to move on uh, from this story here. Thanks, Carrie, for that news. I did want to go to this story that I picked up out of uh, the Internet. Uh, this was featured on Huffington Post about another drug raid uh, gone bad. I'll see if I can switch to the video A here for you. A 76-year-old man had the shock of his life when police officers broke through the front door of his home on a drug raid only to find out they were at the wrong house. News Channel 9's Lee Isaacson talks with this homeowner and the Auburn police about how the mistake was made. Fred Skinner was enjoying a piece of toast at his breakfast table when at least six police officers broke into his house. I had no idea what to do. Fred Skinner said he didn't hear anybody come up to the house. The first noise he heard was as they smashed through this door. Police continued on, breaking this door to pieces, too. They come through that door. They just smashed the door right in. For five minutes, 76-year-old Fred Skinner's house was raided for drugs before police realized they had the wrong house by looking through his mail. And they was trying to put the handcuffs on me. They had my arm back here. So I, um, they said, well, wrong house. So they took, took the handcuffs off me and just left. Auburn police officers were involved in the raid conducted by the Finger Lakes Drug Task Force. Auburn Police Chief Gary Giornata says he only remembers police raiding a wrong house four times in the last 16 years. It was a mistake. We're no different than anyone else. We make mistakes just like everybody else. We try to make sure our information is as current and as reliable as possible. Once in a while, we get it wrong. When we get it wrong, we do make it right. Police reimbursed Skinner $1,250 to fix his doors. A jammer or something that put up to that door there and smashed that door all to pieces. The door will be fixed this week, but the memory of police officers yelling at him not to move with their guns drawn will be with him forever. Lee Isaacson, News Channel 9. 
Now and this is just typical of the drug raids that take place 100 to 150 times per day in America. And, oh, there was only four mistakes. Only four in 16 years. Gee, uh, that's wonderful to hear, uh, officer. Look, when we're talking about using deadly force to break down people's doors, it needs to be commensurate with the crime we're trying to prevent. I got no problem with SWAT teams breaking down doors of violent offenders, people who are an imminent danger to those to the people in the neighborhood, to society in general. General. But when we are using SWAT cops with ballistic armor and automatic weapons to break down people's doors just over drugs, just in fact, usually over marijuana that, that, that people are willing to buy and sell uh, on, on you know, voluntarily, this is insane. The fact is that mistakes will happen. So we need to limit the application where these mistakes could happen to only the most desperate of circumstances. <laughs> Uh, I think we need a little bit of a break. Definitely need of a break, and uh, this is for that 75-year-old guy here, and let's hope he's doing okay. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? Man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a journalist. I'm a student. I'm a teacher. I'm a representative. I have cancer. The outdated laws of prohibition are more dangerous than the plant itself. I lost my scholarship. I was fired. 20 million arrests since 1965. This is getting ridiculous. Our prisons are overcrowded with nonviolent offenders. We have the opportunity to change. This is costing our country billions of dollars. Making my family and I fight in a courtroom is difficult enough when I'm already fighting through chemotherapy. There's no reason to be scared by tradition anymore. We can stop this. We can stop this. We are the American people. We can stop this. And you have our support. We are old. Young. Straight. Gay. We're every race and nationality. And we're not going to give up. You can tax it. You can regulate it. Apply age restrictions. You can create millions of new jobs. We can save our economy. President Obama. It's time for legalization. Legalization. Yes. We can. Pop pass records. It's time for your daily Toker Tunes, the best in 420 friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Groovin' Thursday, our salute to all the dopest beats and killer rhymes that we find in the best of rap, hip-hop, soul, R&B, and funk. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tune. All right, we got Ganja John here in the studio with some great hip-hop music. What's up, John? Yeah, we got Pep Love. Pep now, Love! Coleco and I know Pep Love because we met Pep Love at a concert that Coleco dragged yeah. me to, and I had a great time. Yeah, I'm glad you had a great time. He yeah. was awesome. Uh, he performed uh, as an opening act for the Revolution and uh, the Green Tour. Yeah, yeah, and he's absolutely great. And like Coleco was telling me during the break, he uh, performed during this live HD uh, HD performance they did for charity. And, uh, you know, this guy was born to be a rapper. His, his birth, his given name... Paulo Peacock. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. I'd imagine he wanted to be called Pep Love after being made fun of for being <laughs> Paulo Peacock <laughs> as a child. Born in Jackson, Mississippi, there's not a, really a lot of information about him, but he's an Oakland-based rapper with hieroglyphics, and big thanks to Tim at Hieroglyphics Music for helping us out. And uh, this is from Pep Love's new album, Rigamarole, Runaway Slaves. We'll see you guys on the other side of this. And it got 
and chop it. No benefits for hip hop and a stock options. But it's better than drug dealing, still in a rob. And my brain is bugged. I need to get a lobotomy to get this sickness out of me. My split personality is like a dichotomy. The thick psychology of a slave that had his soul saved like a black Baptist in the South, cradled to the grave. So show the next generation a way to behave. My bars are self therapy for breaking them chains. Who's that peeking in my window? The internet, television, government men in trench coats. The spirit of my ancestors invoked so the devil won't test my testicles. You know, we bring in the gospel and singing the blues. What once was one, now it seems we thinking it too. One, two, the smash. Kuta Kente name will be Toby by the 40 and Blast. You don't want to be a slave, but he do what he has. So when he cries, you'll be singing and laughing. Rise from the ash. Yeah, we give it all we got to get. All we got to get. Get it and go. Get it and go. Yeah, we give it all we got to get. All we got to get a little bit more. Little bit more. I'm like an ex convict trying to get a job. And smoking and drinking and thinking about a nigga problems. I'm getting involved in my own downfall. Probably be doing better living life as an outlaw. My credit score is a metaphor for whip scar. I'm ready for war because peace is a jigsaw. You don't really want to see a nigga get pissed off. My pistol will be popping like bottles of crystal. Like them big balling cats. I kind of want to run up on them and make them give up all they scratch. But I don't want to be a criminal. And I only want to get high because I've been living so low and behold. The path laid was never paved in gold But a lot of rigmarole when this slave was sold Down the Mississippi, I'ma be skinny dipping And if I drown, ain't no telling who I'll be bringing with me One, two, the smash, Kuta Kente name Will be Toby by the 40 and Blast You don't wanna be a slave, but he do what he has So when he cries, you'll be singing and laughing Rise from the ash, yeah We give it all we got to get All we got to get, get it and go, get it and go. Yeah, we give it all we got to get All we got to get a little bit more, a little bit more they keep running, but the sun gon' come in the day. It keep coming, uh, it keep coming, uh, it keep coming. The sun uh, gon' come in the day, day, day. Reading these words like it's Nat Turner written. Spitting these verses like the last words of wisdom. Ripping through the fields, this one for real. Missing these meals, but don't take my silence as an admission of guilt. No response, that just mean I'm bleeding the fit. When these dogs get let loose, bet you won't see me miss. Wasn't never exempt, couldn't never repent from what some had to do just to get where they is. Fist is clenched tight, so that he rip mics, thinking that they grown but living a bitch life, and this is the vice. Putting these words out, wasn't born to sacrifice my rights. I just learned how. Uh. One, two, the smash. Kuta Kente name will be Toby by the 40 and Blast. You don't wanna be a slave, but he do what he has. So when he cries, you'll be singing and laughing. Rise from the ash. Yeah, we give it all we got to get. All we got to get. Get it and go. Get it and go. Yeah, we give it all we got to get. All we got to get a little bit more. Little bit more. Tokers and Tokets, this is Radical Russ from Normal Show Live. We're proud to be the voice of the marijuana nation and proud to have you on our team. Now, you can represent NSL in your own Normal Show Live gear from HandmadeApparel.biz. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel is one of us and a huge supporter of our show. He's designed the classic blockhead line of NSL shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. Worn by Radical Russ, Cannabis Carry, and Ganja John on the show, and at live events, the designs feature their iconic logos and the It's Got To Be 420 Somewhere in the World tagline. Proceeds directly benefit Normal Show Live and HandmadeApparel.biz, one of our community's strongest supporters. You can also get your Cannabis Cure UK, Ganja John Show, Irie Island Hour, and more gear from the Normal Network at HandmadeApparel.biz. Visit HandmadeApparel.biz today. The 
children. My God, won't somebody think of the children? Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back after a word from these 420 friendly sponsors. Hey. Uh, wait a minute. This is internet radio. There are no dials here. On the Sunday mornings when I'm asleep in my dorm room, my parents are busy recording the Leave the Lounge. But I always catch the replay here on the normal network. Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. following Danny Danko's free weed. It's just not something to say. Oh, 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 oh he's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> the Libra Lounge. It's time for a return to the epicenter of American cannabis culture. With our guest, you know her from season one of NBC's Last Comic Standing. It's the Hollywood Hemptress herself, Terry Joyce. All right, glad to have Terry back on the air. But Terry, is this our last time we get to talk to you in Hollywood? Terry? Oh, Terry can't hear us right now for some reason. All right, well, we're going to work on that in the background uh, while we see... Oh, there's something. Do we have someone there on the line? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to go on to a break then, and we'll see if we can get some uh, of these things fixed. So uh, stay tuned. We'll play some Keller Williams until we can get this fixed. To the mountain, I was drinking some wine. Look up in the heaven, lost saw my out of sight. Ready to fire across the hill. Plain is black and white, get prepared. It's gonna be a party tonight. Oh, it's Saturday night. Channel 6 president come on news said I get no satisfaction while I sing the blues. Why about a list of no, no, just what to do? Just crack out that old Victoria, break out your rocket shoes, George. It's Saturday night. Oh, uh -huh. one more Saturday Down the local armory with the basement full of dynamite, live artillery. Temperature keep rising, everybody getting high. Come on, rock and stroke at midnight, this joint is gonna fly on. Oh, it's Saturday night. Oh, uh -huh. one more Saturday. We 
It's time for a return to the epicenter of American cannabis culture. With our guest, you know her from season one of NBC's Last Comic Standing. It's the Hollywood Hemptress herself, Terry Joyce. Oh, it feels like I just went through a time warp. I, I heard this before. Hi, Terry. Hi. Hi. How are you? The mysteries of Skype continue, but we got you on the phone, so the backup plan is working. This is true. You know, I, I think I might have messed up with my, my speaker on my Skype. I've been uh, communicating actually with a friend of mine in India. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, it was making a weird noise and I might have turned it off and now I don't know what happened. Damn well, it. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, is this the uh, last opportunity we get to talk to the Hollywood Hemptress in Hollywood? You're moving up here, aren't you? Yeah, I am moving up there, but you know, I'm going to be up there right around April 20th. So I think we have another one next Thursday. Uh. And then after that... Um, I will be um, living up in Portland. And then also, um, half the time down in Los Angeles, I'm kind of going to be splitting myself into places, but I like it. All right. Well, that sounds fun. Uh, since we got to not a lot of time left, let's get to your guest. Tell us all about what's going on. Sure. Uh, my guest, we met in the oddest way. Uh, actually, we met in the raid together uh, about uh, five years ago, and he was hogtied right like next to me. Yeah. Um, when the uh, yeah, and I was like, "Well, what did he do?" And he didn't do anything. That's the whole the whole mystery of it all, you know. And so, um, we worked on um, different things, and our lives kind of intertwined with this whole movement. And I want to introduce um, Patrick Duff to hi. the show. Hi, Patrick. Hey, how you doing? Uh, we're doing good. I think we've had you on the show before, and you were uh, involved in all sorts of uh, uh, legal things going on down there as far as the crackdown and the, and the feds trying to take down dispensaries. Uh, remind our listeners uh, your background. Well, uh, my background is, uh, I guess you could say first, it started in Philadelphia in the sense of activism with cannabis, where mm -hmm. I uh, put on some um, radio shows in Philadelphia where I had the likes of Jack Herrer on, Mark Emery, um, all types of different... Um, uh, let's say counterculture heroes to me, sure. and in the Philadelphia area, it's an area that's it's very conservative. So I wanted to get, let's say, the liberal voice out there, or at least the most liberal voices I could. And from there, I kind of it kind of catapulted me uh, in the sense that um, I went to the Liberty Bell with with a uh, with a fellow named uh, N.J. Weedman. Yeah, yeah. Talked to Ed uh, Forshion uh, back out in L.A. In, in February. It was nice to see him, and we did a little interview. So yeah, we know about uh, New Jersey yeah. Weedman. He's on his way right now to New Jersey to fight uh, 12 years, and he's fighting a jury nullification case in mm -hmm. April. He, he's going to trial. So, um, but, but what happened is we went to the Liberty Bell together. We decided that we would um, um, enjoy a religious sacrament at the Liberty Bell and, and get arrested on purpose several times in order to uh, bring light to uh, a, a law that we both uh, know about and that we both have read, which is called the Religious Freedom of Restoration Act. Mm -hmm. um, we went through the trial, and we actually uh, lost during the trial, and then on appeal, we were granted the right to use and possess cannabis anywhere in the country, um, but only us, the way they worded the wording. So <laughs> oh, I kind of wow. used that. Yeah, I kind of used that uh, situation and, and, and brought it out to California and, and opened up churches um, that were also collectives that were helping out the ca uh, patients of California. And the reason why I did that was because I saw that people who are opening just regular collectives were under major scrutiny and under under the risk of, of um, prosecution, because uh, because federally there was no defense um, to medical marijuana at that right. point, and still at this point there isn't. So it was more of a a way to see if access could just be con considered or con continued if access in the other way was denied. Mm. So I think that me and you actually have had conversation about this before, yeah. whereas I believe everybody absolutely should have access mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be just strict strictly uh um precluded for one religion or, or or one type of religion um but at the same time um the catholic church they give food to the poor and, and they don't have to be catholic to receive the food right. and it was the same it was the same idea that i had which it, i would be dispensing cannabis to the people who needed it but doing it from a church so they're protected in a different way Hmm. All right, and, so uh, um, the latest thing I've heard, though, is that you got uh, into some uh, suit with the LAPD and ended up winning this one. Am, uh, am I jumping too far ahead? Yeah, well, no. What, what happened was the LAPD had me arrested on, on all kinds of bogus charges because they could never figure out how to charge me with actual cannabis charges. Um, 
So they arrested me because of a, a previous landlord of mine. One of the, the, the location that I had, it was very popular. He had me evicted from the location and arrested on all kinds of bogus charges. The LAPD then um, told me they were, I'm sorry, the city attorney told me they were dropping all charges. Mm -hmm. So I had no charges against me. And uh, come to find out, I go for a job interview that they put five warrants out for my arrest <laughs> for everything from battery battery on a police officer to terrorist threats. So, I don't know if anybody knows, but if you have unknown warrants out there, and one of them is for battery on a police officer, when you get pulled over, you are not going to be treated very fairly. Right. Um, so luckily I didn't get pulled over, and luckily I found out through other means, went and turned myself in, and just about six, seven months ago I took it to trial. I was facing five and a half years in jail um, for absolute bogus charges. Uh, they offered me one year probation with uh, with basically you know no visitation or anything, and I told them to uh, to shove it and uh, I'd like to take it to trial and we took it to trial and I beat them on Good. every single charge except for disturbing the peace, um, which the jury themselves admitted they didn't really understand the First Amendment, which I just filed my appeal for that and the cool thing about that is I, I I'll now have a precedent setting case for First Amendment speech and also for First Amendment religion uh, with my name attached to it. Hmm, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, if you can, send me some uh, some links and some information on that. I'd love to write it up and uh, get some more attention to these uh, decisions. This would be yeah, good and, stuff. And t to tell you, Russ, the, 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 the one thing I'd like to touch on real quick is because the way I got semi-screwed out of one of my properties is, is I'm actually involved in another lawsuit right now with an attorney um, named David Welch, who I'm suing for um, legal malpractice. We're in trial May 29th. Um, he didn't file any answers for my eviction cases. They were at the Liberty Bell Temple, and I was evicted from my house and my church um, because no answers were filed on time. And so that is, he's an attorney who's very well known right now in the medical marijuana field, but not a lot of people know that, um, that I'm suing him at this point for legal malpractice, hmm. and that the case itself is going to be um, extremely telling on his views. If you looked at his, his uh, description of me calling me an illegal drug dealer and, um, and, and just several this wonderful your defense attorney? This was my former defense attorney, <laughs> David Welch. Wow, okay. All so, right. he's, he's a defense attorney to hundreds of collectives in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. I mean, quite literally hundreds. He's handling that, that Lake Forest case that just went to, uh, to, to court there. and um, so, so I guess my... my what I, what I can say is hopefully in May I get to recoup some of the losses I have and then I can um, open another church up for the patients of Los Angeles. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a very interesting story. We're speaking with Patrick Duff, and uh, Terry Joyce is on the line as well with us. And, Terry, I just want to give you a chance to get some questions in if you wanted to. Well, yeah, I have a question for Patrick. Uh, now, after you, I, I'd like to know more about your uh, your church and some of the visions that you that you have. Um about the medical marijuana community. I know that you're very compassionate and have a certain ethics about price and stuff like that. So what is your, what is your vision of where we can go with cannabis in Los Angeles? Well, I, I can tell you that the, having myself personally, two different friends who have been shot and killed over cannabis, and, um, and knowing that it was strictly because of the value of such, and if the value of cannabis was that of cauliflower or broccoli, I would still have two of my good friends here with me. Mm -hmm. uh, my goal has been to do everything I can to devalue um, cannabis to at least to be affordable enough and also to be um, to take away some of the black market um, uh, essence of it, which which is the amount of money that can be made off of a small amount of items. So that's just any black market, just 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 size of, of, of let's say a package to how much you can charge for it. So when I came to LA first in 2005, they were charging you know, 85 to 105 dollars for an eighth of OG Kush. So my mission was to make sure that, that that price went down. And in the first couple months that I was open in LA and I was doing 55 dollars, nothing over 55 dollars for the same thing people were doing for 85 and 100, I received death threats on my answering machine. Um, so I mean, I know how price, let's say the price of cannabis coming down can affect certain people, but I also know that the, the, the most people that are affected by it would be the actual patients who can't afford it when it's at $100 name. Right. And therefore, therefore, they can't eat, and they're going to waste. So my mission in L.A. with my places was also to give free medicine to people who needed it. 
So, I mean, I, I'd say over a course of five years, I mean, I, I couldn't even count the amount that was given away, but, um, you know, I had people that would volunteer for me who would sit there and say, well, how do you guys, uh, you know, make any money? And I said, well, that's the point of this is to not make money. It's not for profit. It's to give back to the people and make sure they have everything they need. I mean, I would pay for people's operations, for people's mortgages, um, people's rents if they needed it. Mm. So... That is fantastic, sure Patrick, that and, and, and that goal, you know, that is such a laudable goal to get the prices down, and of course, you know, the more that we uh, improve access, and, and of course, the the best access is legalization, those prices should Absolutely. continue to continue to go down, and I appreciate you doing that. We're, we're out of time, unfortunately, for the segment, but Patrick, I want to thank you for stopping back here at Normal Show Live, and uh, Terry, uh, again, for bringing us more great guests like you always do, and uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks, we'll- Terry. When we come back, a little time for some Radical Rant. We're going to talk about the real threat of impaired drivers out there on the road. And it ain't me and John. Be right back after this. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Almost busted in Laredo, but for reasons that I'd rather not disclose. I smoke pot, and I like it a lot. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer to use than alcohol. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting responsible marijuana smokers in America. And to learn what you can do to help, please contact Normal at www.normal.com. Dot org or call toll free at 888-67-NORMAL. The show was long and we were just sitting there and we'd come to play and not just for the ride. How's it everyone? This is Yee from Pepper and you're listening to the Normal Show Live. Right. What makes something funny? How does humor impact health and psychological well-being? How can you incorporate humor into everyday life? A concise, reader-friendly introduction to an important but often underappreciated topic in modern psychology, Humor 101 explains the role of comedy, jokes, and wit in the sciences and discusses why they are so important to understand. Psychology professor Dr. Mitch Earlywine draws from his personal experiences in stand-up comedy to focus on how humor can regulate emotion, reduce anxiety, and diffuse tense situations, expose pretensions, build personal relationships, and much more. He irreverently debunks the pseudoscience on the topic of humor and leaves readers not only funnier, but better informed. It's part of the Psych 101 series from Springer Publishing, Humor 101, by Dr. Mitch Earlywine, Ph.D. I fart in your general direction. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. You okay to land this thing? No problem, man. I think you're going a little high, man. It's okay, man. If there's one thing I know, it's how to drive when I'm stoned. It's like you know your perspective's fucked, so you just gotta let your hands work the controls as if you're straight. my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Rant. Well, uh, interesting little thing about today's Radical Rant. Uh, I was uh, going to title it something about sleepy drivers, and I got to thinking about, oh, sleepy, one of the seven dwarfs, right? You know, the seven dwarfs, uh, Doc, Grumpy, Happy, Sleepy, Bashful, Sneezy, and Dopey. Uh, And then I realized that Snow White 
was made in 1937, the same year that marijuana prohibition took place. So kind of a weird tie in there. But uh, this rant is a little bit about sleepy drivers. The one dwarf who should never drive is sleepy. While the legislators are worried about the stone drivers, sleepy drivers cause one out of six fatal crashes in America. Now, with marijuana legislation legalization on the horizon in Washington and Colorado, plus more and more states adopting medical legalization of marijuana, the prohibitionists are trotting out the scare of, what about the stoned drivers? Once again, and it is an effective scare because we found that the exit polls for Prop 19 showed that failure to address the issue of stoned drivers caused many undecided voters to vote no on legalization. So in response, the strategists for Washington's I-502 included a controversial five nanogram per milliliter impairment standard for THC in the blood to address that uh, concern of voters. Now, Colorado's strategists for regulate marijuana like alcohol did not include a per se DUID provision. So their legislature is reviving a five nanogram per milliliter impairment standard in a bill that died in the previous session. Now, of course, what it is not is an accurate scare. Foremost about what about the stone drivers is that it's built on a false premise that once we legalize marijuana, suddenly there'll be stone drivers. It's as if without legalization, there are no pot smokers, which of course is ludicrous. There's 26 million of us smoking pot every year, 17 million of us smoking pot every month, and 2.6 million of us smoking pot every day. So if there are people driving stoned, they're driving stoned now. Second, we already have pretty good means of catching stone drivers. Prosecutors in California win four out of five DUID prosecutions. And in Colorado, the success rate is closer to nine out of 10. And nobody can deny that those states have very active cannabis cultures that are the closest America currently has to legalization. And third, if someone is so dedicated to following the law that they're not gonna smoke pot until it's legalized, then why are they then going to break DUID laws, these new tokers? Fourth, the studies that we have show that pot smoking drivers aren't that big of a threat anyway. The risk of even the most drug impaired drivers ranks around the same risk as a 0.05 blood alcohol driver. And that's below that 0.08 legal limit, so-called legal limit, where we don't automatically assume someone's impaired under the law. In fact, stone drivers in one study did just as well on the driving simulator tests as they did when they were sober. Stone drivers also tend to drive slower and leave more room between cars in traffic. Fifth, the scary stats that the prohibitionists will throw at you regarding how many drivers in fatal accidents had pot in their system, well, that's all irrelevant. Since pot can be detected in your system long after any impairing effects have worn off, all those stats tell us is that lots of people who drive cars also smoke pot. Even the Department of Transportation says that trying to evaluate impairment on cannabis based solely on body, body chemistry is inadvisable. That's their words. Now, on the other hand, there are a whole bunch of scary drivers that legislators never seem to mention. I was looking over Huffington Post today and I was reading a, a post in their entertainment section about uh, the, the people behind the scenes, the gaffers, the grips, the makeup people, the cameramen, all these people that make up the bulk of Hollywood, what we call Hollywood, and how these people are typically working 17 hour work days. And it also told the tragic story of, of one uh, such worker who died when he fell asleep at the wheel coming back from a late uh, a shoot at one of these uh, productions. And, and this happens more often than we'd like to admit. So in that Huffington Post report about these 17 hour workdays in Hollywood, it linked to a 2010 report on sleepy or drowsy drivers that I thought we should all uh, learn about. This is from that report. An estimated one in six fatal crashes, nearly 17%, involves a drowsy driver, which is about four to five times higher than previous studies had found. And drowsy drivers are involved in one out of eight crashes that involves a serious injury, the report found. The report found that 41% of respondents admitted to falling asleep or nodding off while driving at some point in their lives. That's two out of five. One out of 10 acknowledged doing so in the past year. 
More than a quarter, or 27% of those surveyed, admitted that in the previous month, they drove despite being so tired that they had difficulty keeping their eyes open. Thomas J. Balkin, a sleep researcher and chairman of the National Sleep Foundation, said there is some suggestion that people are more sleep deprived than 30 to 40 years ago, when the average amount of sleep was about eight hours a night. Today, the average is about seven hours a night. And he said, quote, people on the lower end who are getting about five to six hours of sleep per night pose a danger to themselves and others, end quote. But nobody wants to address that danger on the freeways. Why are people only getting five to seven hours of sleep? Hmm? Uh, because they have to work two jobs or three jobs, or they have to work two or three jobs and raise a kid, or they have to work a job and try to go to school, or just because they work in America, this hyper-competitive workaholic nation that considers a 40-hour work week to be some sort of slacker luxury, and more than two weeks of vacation is something only those stinky, lazy socialist Europeans do. Besides, if you're sleepy, you can just get a five-hour energy shot a concentrated caffeine garana taurine blend whose commercials show happy people at work hitting that 2.30 p.m. feeling, drinking a shot, and then being alert and energized. Even the guy driving the semi-truck down the freeway. I literally took a look at this today on the 5-Hour Energy website. Please go to the blog at stash.normal.org. And I took screenshots from their all of their TV commercials that they have ar archived in here. And these are the people that are the consumers of five hour energy who hit that 230 wall. And so they're so tired, you gotta have a shot of energy before they continue their job. And here's some of the jobs in the picture here. A welder working overtime, a bow hunter out in the woods, a short order cook around flame and hot surfaces, a truck driver driving one of those big rigs with all the cars on it. A mom who is rushed for her morning commute. A man riding a motorcycle. A busy college student delivering pizza late at night. A guy in an orange safety vest sitting at the break room at the plant. And a guy working in a manufacturing plant working the night shift. Yes, we don't need to worry about them being sleepy. Just take a five-hour energy shot and everything will be just fine. No, no. See, the thing is, is we can accept someone working 10 to 14 hour days and driving two hour commutes and chasing coffee and energy drinks to try to stay alert on the freeways because that contributes to corporate America's bottom line. More work out of fewer workers means corporate profits. We can even accept taverns with parking lots, knowing that people will drive there to get drunk and not all of them will have a designated driver. We'll promote alcohol at sporting events that people, that people have to drive to and we'll let them drink beer in the parking lots and the stadium before they leave. We can accept all that danger of serving alcohol at places you have to drive to because, again, there's some corporate profits to be made. Yet a driver who may have smoked marijuana a minute or a month ago can have his license revoked and his ass in jail in some states if a molecule of marijuana metabolite shows up on a p-test. Not because he's any sort of serious danger on the freeways, especially compared to the sleepy or drunk driver. No, because accepting the truth that the marijuana driver is relatively benign is to invite legalization of something very threatening to the corporation's bottom lines. That's your Radical Rant today. I also wanted to get to a little news story while I still have just about a minute left to go. Uh, you may have noticed or you may have heard that the Discovery Channel has canceled Weed Wars, the, the Weed Wars show with uh, Stephen D'Angelo. Yes, unfortunately, canceled the Weed Wars show. This is from uh, Stephen D'Angelo's press release. We want to take this opportunity to inform everyone of the Discovery Channel decision regarding the future of our groundbreaking television program, Weed Wars. All the accomplishments of Weed Wars won't be fully realized for another generation, as all the people who saw the program move throughout the world and activate themselves with the cannabis plant. We are certain that 10 and 20 years from now, people will stop us on the street and mention how Weed Wars changed their lives. Nothing would please us more than to be able to continue with future episodes of Weed Wars. Unfortunately, the Discovery Channel has made a much different decision and will no longer continue with future episodes. We do not know why, nor do we understand why they made that decision. Well, it's kind of unfortunate. As much as I disagree with Stephen D'Angelo on the 
not supporting recreational cannabis legalization. I do feel that Weed Wars did more good than harm in promoting, you know, professional distribution of marijuana. Uh, but I, what I think happened is that the mundane nature of weed, I mean, it was just kind of boring, really. It's like doing a show about tellers at a bank. It just wasn't very much drama to it. Uh, unfortunate, but that's the way the, uh, the entertainment world works. All right, folks, we're going to take it into Hour 2, which will be available as a podcast starting on Monday. Hanging out with Ganja John, Wiz Coleco, and Cannabis Carry. And I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. is Normal Show Live, the voice of the Marijuana Nation. Take it on one more time. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. You're listening to the Normal Network.